This video contains information that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are a viewer and are triggered or shocked by images and need a warning prior to every clip or story being discussed, then please unsubscribe from my channel immediately. My channel covers the harsh reality of even the worst crimes imaginable and is for adults only. For those of you who fit into this category, take this message as your warning and don't watch any further. Just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, all of a sudden the, the ending music was playing. I'm about to get the other one. Plus my wife's cooking food, so... That's what it's supposed to be. Alright, there you go. We're going to do the flyby right at the beginning of the show. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, there we go. All right, that's the right music. Ugh. Yeah, it was weird. A minute ago, I was just uh, in the shower washing my hair, and then all of a sudden, there was like this those sparkles you get in your eye. I got kind of dizzy. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe because I'm sitting so much. That, but I had already already been standing for a while, so it felt kind of weird. I hope there's something else going on there. Yeah, so, you know, today, is just, if there's any improvement, it's very little. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to have to wait it out, maybe in a couple of weeks, see how it's doing in a week. I wish I could just go to sleep and wake up. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's different. I get that the ocular migraine thing's different. Yeah, I can move it. I can move my neck. I mean, because there's just a scar back here, but it's very stiff behind my neck and very, uh, very sore bef behind both shoulders. Yeah, so I think that's where they strapped me down. But anyways, hey, everybody, check it out, man. Anthony Greeno is, he put out a video today. Okay, and he's telling everybody if they send him $1,000, he won't have to go to court uh, or be, uh, let's see, will be able to get money for bail in uh, Carroll County because he owes child support there. All right, so let, let me just say this, everybody. Send his kid money before you send him a nickel, okay? All right, the kid that he's not paying child support to pay that kid some money but what, what he did was is he you know how when you're in prison you can watch a video with the person you're talking to so they can see you in person well he had the person on the other line record it and then upload it because it was really a message to all of his fans are you kidding me everybody my god and you know of course his idiotic fans out there will say something like see great look what he does he did oh give me a break god think about how ludicrous that is Hey, send me a thousand dollars for bail, and then I can start making videos again. Instead of giving money for the children that he's not paying, and that's why he's going to be put back in jail again. All right, so just everyone, just realize what's going on. Okay, it's he's an he's always been an embarrassment. He does have skill and some talent, but he is a not a good person whatsoever. And the fact that any of you guys out there even think that what at all is scary, okay? 
All right, good. That's what I'm going to say right now. And I did. I just said what I'm going to say. I can't stand the guy. You know, he is really one of the worst of the worst and has done nothing for anybody. Okay. All right, so we are going to switch over now to a... Well, actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to play something first because it's another... I had it queued up yesterday for uh, Sheriff Grady, Judd, because he made a he had another uh, video yesterday of a different crime, and it's just <laughs> I just love listening to the guy. So we're gonna have to watch that one right now. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to update you about a shooting that occurred just prior to 6:40 this morning, and here's how it all began. Two couples, four people, went out for the evening last night. Thanks, Cairo. And they returned home at about 4 a.m. this morning. When I say return home, one person of the four lives at this residence. Slightly smiling whose face. address we're not permitted to hand out because they are a victim of a crime. So the two males and two females arrive at this particular residence and after some period of time an argument occurs between a girlfriend and a boyfriend and it becomes a very heated argument. The boyfriend says I'm leaving so he and the other male get in the car and leave. The girlfriend says I'm staying here and the house she's staying at is not her house but is the house of the victim. See what's amazing is how absolutely clear this guy explains everything. So the two ladies are at the victim's house. The two guys have now departed. They've left. The boyfriend who's driving gets to the end of the road and he says I'm going back and get her. She's going with me. So he turns around and he comes back to the house. Now the friend that's with him, who's not been drinking, says, hey, let's just leave. Let's just go. So he says, no, she's going with me. So he arrives at the residence and he begins kicking and banging on the front door, demanding that his girlfriend come outside. No one answers the door. He immediately runs back to his vehicle and gets a tire iron. The friend is telling him again, let's just leave. He doesn't. He takes the tire iron, he runs up to the house to a window. It appears to be a bedroom window. And he screams and hollers, if you don't let me in, I'm knocking the windows out and coming in. There's no response. He takes the tire iron, he begins to break into the home. He tears through the screen, he breaks the glass with the tire iron, and the homeowner shoots, and there's where he dies. At the scene, you can see the tire iron at his feet. He's deceased from his gunshot wound. All of the information we give you this morning is preliminary information and certainly it's subject to change as the investigation continues throughout the day. However, at this early stage of the investigation, it appears that the shooter was perfectly le legal. The shooter was perfectly legal yeah, got that right. to defend her home from a burglar. This is another incident where you just should have left. But when you came back to the <laughs> house, it's just so simple. It's yeah. not your home. This is great. And you tried to break in to get a girlfriend who didn't want to go with you. And you're shot and killed while breaking into the house with a tire iron. That's a bad choice. And it's the last bad choice he'll make. <laughs> so once again, the information we give you oh, is totally man. preliminary anytime we're talking. <laughs> you see, I mean, look how great that is. I mean, I'm not, I don't think it's funny that somebody got killed. It's just, 
how absolutely clear and obvious it is. It was a bad choice, and that'll be the last choice he ever makes. Bad choice. To you within two or three hours of the investigation, we're giving you the best information we know now. That's preliminarily the information that's been given to us by the witnesses at the scene. And it's pretty clear cut. What they said at this point matches up exactly to what we see at the crime scene where he was committing a forcible felony by trying to break back into this house with a tire iron. Are there any questions? Can you tell us, was it just one shot fired? We're determining how many shots were fired. Wouldn't matter. But whether it was one or more shots, it was a fatal shot, obviously, that took him out. And he died immediately. He did not move from the front window that he was attempting to break into. We have no idea, obviously, that will be part of the medical examiner's investigation. However, he was drinking earlier in the evening. But his friend appears not to be under the influence of any alcohol, and his friend tells, tells us during the interview that he doesn't drink, wasn't drinking last night, and doesn't appear to be drinking. But had our suspect to the home invasion listened to his friend and gotten back into the vehicle and left he would be alive to continue his domestic conversation with his girlfriend but once again you can't break into people's homes you can't take a tire iron and do a forcible <laughs> felony and from all indications it's that's exactly what he has was to happening. say that to anybody the women were the only he two people YouTube inside. Channel. The That's homeowner did the shooting. The person's girlfriend was not in the room when the event occurred, at least according to the preliminary information. But you had the right to protect yourself in your home and to be free from home invaders, armed burglars, and certainly he was armed with a tire iron and making an attempt to come into the window. She stopped him. She stopped him permanently. She stopped him permanently. The other woman, not the girlfriend, but the second woman is the homeowner? Yes. Okay. Yes, she owns the home. Do you have any ages of all four people roughly involved? We, we will release that later today. We want to make sure that we complete our initial investigation that we notify the next of kin and then we will release that information. Were they sleeping when he arrived or were they still up from the evening? No, there's every indication that they were not asleep, at least according to our initial information. All right. Thank you very much. We'll update you through the day as the investigation goes on. So once again, the information we're talking to you know now, us, and it's pretty clear cut. What they said we see at the crime scene by trying to break back into this house with a tire iron. Are there any questions? But obviously that the front. I gotta go make a uh, get a, a clip of that quote where he said, and that'll be the last mistake he ever made. We'll have to have that one. Anyways, uh, let's see. I'm going to go, now I'm going to start covering those three cases. Absolutely brutal, ridiculous cases. Somebody in the last video said, hey, why don't you look at this one? And I think Zozo told her, hey, send an email, but she never sent an email, but I saw it there. So I looked it up, and then it led to two others, and then it's like, oh, jeez, absolutely crazy shit. But anyways, hey, thanks. Uh, what was it? Teacher Man, 1955. And don't forget, everybody, I'm just a cup of coffee, all right? We got to keep, keep it rolling. All right. So I think I'm going to start off with, yes, Angie Hausman. Here.
All right, hold on. Uh, let me get the folder open. Uh, there it is. Okay, Angie Hausman, I believe, is was nine. And this is all, again, this is all in, uh, well, this first one was in Missouri. So I, it's not, it wasn't Texas like I was thinking. but It's in Missouri, and here it is. Schoolgirl abducted near her home. I mean, this is just one of the craziest, it's just ridiculous what, what happens. Uh, after school, nine-year-old Angie Marie Hausman would usually enter the house in St. Anne's, set down her blue and white book bag, and share stories about the day. She always proud about what she'd make in school, her mother Diane Bone said Friday. She'd come in and say, look, Mommy. She's always happy, very outgoing. She's all, she'd always tell me what she was going, uh, if she was going to a friend's house. That didn't happen Thursday. Angie apparently was abducted between her bus stop and home a half block away, police say. St. Anne police used dogs and helicopters with infrared sensors Friday to search for her. Hey, thanks, Crystal Ann. Hey, that's three cups of coffee. It's nice to be among such beauty and brains this evening. Hot. Gray baby, that neck so you get better. Okay. I will. I'm trying to. Yeah, that's not a really big number. But I'm not talking about one of the famous cases today, so it's amazing we have over 200 people in here. Uh, that didn't happen Thursday. Angie apparently was abducted between her bus stop and home a half block away, police say. So, I mean, it's just really crazy. Let me get to this one. Uh, yeah, so this is her home right here. And then the bus stop is just right here. And the bus had already dropped her off from school at like a four o'clock. Okay, and she never made it home to here. That little tiny distance right there. So this is her house right here. If there's street view, I don't know if there is in Missouri. Let's see. I didn't even look, but you can see it pretty good just with the 3D view. So it's that house right there. And there was a bus stop just down the street. So a, a pupil at Rittenauer's uh, Buter School, I don't even know what that's saying, Buter School, Angie was last seen about 4 p.m. Thursday when she, oh, that's her name, Rittenauer's, what does that mean, a pupil at Rittenauer's Buter School? I thought she went somewhere else was last seen at about 4 p.m. Thursday when she hopped from the school bus and walked north on Wright Avenue towards her family duplex, eight houses up. Yeah, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right, exactly right there. Right now, we're handling it as an abduction because of her age and the length of time she'd been missing. Mantle said Angie's disappearance might be connected to an attempted abduction in Mar Maryland Heights on November 8th. Then a man grabbed an 11-year-old girl who looked similar to Angie just after she got off her school bus about 3.50 p.m. He pulled her into some bushes along a road, but she managed to break free. Police were still looking for the man Friday and distributed copies of a composite sketch to police officers who set up roadblocks at St. Anne near Angie's home. Angie was last seen carrying the blue and white Christian Hospital Northeast book bag and wearing blue jeans, white tennis shoes, and long pink coat with hood. She's about 5 feet tall, 65 pounds, with blue eyes, brown hair, and a scar on her chin. Okay, so I think this is from the other suspect that they were looking for. Anyone with information should call the St. Anne police. Mantle said a girl on the bus remembered seeing Angie walking down Wright Avenue alone. Duplex homes 
would have been to Angie's right, to her left, a large evergreen tree and and St. Gregory School parking lot. And so that's all right there. This That's what this is. At the time, Angie should have arrived home. Bone was asleep. This is her, her dad. So about 1 a.m. Friday, detectives used a St. Louis County police helicopter equipped with heat sensors to search every park in the St. Anne and the Coldwater Creek area. At the time, Angie should have arrived home. Bone was asleep, as was Angie's two-year-old brother, Angie's stepfather, Ronald Bone, an auto mechanic, came home at about 5 p.m. and woke up. Bone. So woke up her, must have been her brother. The other, you know, the, another Bone, I guess. Her family and neighbors searched the neighborhood before flagging down a police car at 7 p.m. Ronald Bone described the neighborhood as quiet with very few disturbances, even though a motorcycle club operates nearby. We are still looking on the positive side, he said. Okay, so that was on the 20th. And then there's uh, on the 24th. About 40 police officers from St. Louis County searched the banks of Coldwater Creek and five parks around St. Anne Tuesday looking for clues for the disappearance of nine-year-old Angie Marie Hausman. They found nothing. Angie vanished about 4 p.m. Thursday in the four blocks between her school bus. It's not four blocks. It's like eight houses. Ron Bone, 34, the girl's stepfather, said police were interrogating family members. He said he took a lie detector test Monday. Bone, bleary-eyed bleary with exhaustion, said he couldn't remember much about the questions police have asked him. Bone, an auto mechanic at the Sears store in Northwest Plaza, said he last saw Angie at 8 a.m. Thursday when, she left, when he left for work. He got home just after 5 p.m. and found that she had never returned home. So she was abducted almost immediately after she left her uh, school bus. She's been my daughter since she was one, Bone said. I am hanging on onto her as my daughter, and she calls me dad. Angie's mother, Diane Bone, 29, spent nearly four hours Thursday morning at the police station. So, you know, the family's trying to, they're trying to rule out the family and check that out. So just a second. Moving on to the next one. So four days later, missing nine-year-old found dead. The 10-day search for Angie Marie Hausman ended Saturday morning when a deer hunter found the child's body near a wooded ravine in the August A. Bush Wildlife Area in St. Charles County, police say. Our worst fears have materialized, said Sergeant Robert Lowry, Jr., Deputy Commander. We feel very confident that it's Angie Hausman. I'm about 100% convinced it is the right girl. Now this is a homicide investigation, he said. The hunter found the body of 9-year-old St. Anne girl at 11.15 a.m. on a bitterly cold day just west of Miller School Road near Highway 94 and just south of U.S. Highway 40, Interstate Police said. And that's over here. She was found right in this, almost exactly where I have this, in this area. So th those are all the locations, 64, 94, Miller School Road. So it's right in this area she was found. And I think it's something like, let's get a measurement. Yeah, it's about almost 20 miles driving. They uh, let's see, Debbie Skaggs of St. John's, Angie's aunt, said police told her that Angie had been shot in the hand. They said she had to have been killed by someone she knew. Skaggs is a sister of Angelo D'Andrea, 
Angie's biological father. At 4 p.m., Angie's stepfather, Ron Bone, and other family members left the St. Anne police station and hurriedly got into a car. Bone, Bone's hand shook violently as he held a cigarette in the back seat. Yeah, I mean, it's just a total nightmare, you know. I mean, there she is, and this is... That's the stepfather, I guess, right there. He doesn't really look like that anymore, that's for sure. And this is the area right here. And I think what you're seeing here, see how the road turns around like that? I think that uh, it's right on that road. And you can't go to Street View, but see how it curves right there? And I think that's what we're, she was found over in that area. Okay, then on December 14th, you know, they were, they were going around to schools telling all the kids to, you know, keep their guard up because they hadn't caught the person. And then, um, you know, same thing, just, yeah, it says strangers are not always evil looking. How a child molester gains a child's confidence. The childs are most vulnerable when alone. These are things that were taught to the, the kids at these schools. I mean, it just blows that you have to do this. They're just trying to get, they're just out there having fun. Man is best suspect in Hausman case. So they, can, they come up with a guy, John Parsons here. He, this guy is a sick dude. Uh, but it turns out he had nothing, he had nothing to do with it either. Uh, but here, but listen, it's kind of an interesting story here. The major case squad on Wednesday targeted Parsons as a 34-year-old convenience store clerk as the focal point in the four-and-a-half-month hunt for Angie's killer. Parsons was described as a freelance roofer who once worked in the St. Louis area. This is the best suspect we have in the killing of Angie Hausman, a nine-year-old girl from St. Anne. Uh, let's see. Three St. Louis area investigators will be in... Florida today, the FBI plans to analyze Parsons' hair and blood. Earlier this month, a woman who owns a film processing store in Manatee, Florida, became suspicious about Parsons' snapshots of children in provocative poses. She told police who raided his home in Florida and found hundreds of pornographic photos and a tie to Hausman's case. Parsman, uh, Parsons had in his home a uh, post-dispatch clipping about Angie's death and newspaper color photographs of Angie. Wow. Authorities also found other evidence that may tie him to the case. They refused to elaborate. But later on, it turns out he wasn't the, the person. That day, he I think he was arrested for something else later. All right, so now we're uh, about 1995, November... Police get leads all the time, but after two years, Angie Hausman's death is unsolved. There have been more than a thousand suspects in the Angie Hausman murder case, but after two years, police are still looking for the killer. We get leads all the time, said Colonel Robert Lowry. We check each and every one out, and each and every time, they haven't panned out. On November 18, 1993, Angie disappeared after she got off a school bus one block from her home in St. Anne on November 27th, a hunter found her body at the end of a lover's lane in the Bush Wildlife Area in St. Charles County. So, you know, I guess it could be that it, she was found right over here. Because, I mean, I would imagine if it's lover's lane, you would have pulled into here and parked. And you can actually go back to almost, this is 1990. That's what it looked like right then. So that's actually like three years prior. A second. <clears throat> 
Okay, so there's another person, Gary Suffelbean, another former suspect, pleaded guilty in March to kidnapping and sexual abuse. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Suffelbean's guilty plea stemmed from a molestation November 8, 1993, of a girl, 11, as she walked along a street in the Maryland Heights. As Suffelbean tried to lead the girl to his car, she broke free. So that was that one that we talked about. Suffelbean, who was from Texas, surrendered as police later in December 1993 as, and was ruled out as a suspect in the murders. Police feared that they were dealing with a serial killer intensified when Cassidy Center 10 was abducted on December 1, 1993. Cassidy disappeared from near home in North St. Louis County. Her badly beaten body was found several days later in St. Louis. Thomas L. Brooks Jr. and St. Louis of St. Louis, who had been living in Cassidy neighborhood, was convicted of that murder in September and sentenced to death. Nothing has changed in the last two years for Diane Bone. I had to move in. another year later, 1996. Angie Houseman case haunts investigators because they just can't get any answers. And there's a $95,000 reward, too, so I mean, it's up there. And then a year after that, patient told nurse of involvement in killing. So th there's a guy that was in, named Bryant Squires, Squires, I mean. He was in, um, on his deathbed, and he said that he and another person did it. And, it, you know, he had some of the information. But see, the, the thing is, is the information that, that he knew was in the newspaper. Okay. So we don't, you don't really know. That's why police try to hide, keep stuff from people. Okay. So now I'm going to, uh, I think in, in 2019, however, they did make an arrest in the case. Okay. <laughs> so this is one that's solved. Uh, but I'm going to play you guys some of these clips here. I'm going to play you the press conference. And so it just kind of went cold. They talked about it over the years, but this one actually has some resolution to it. It's just that, but it's kidnapping in the first. But what I have to tell you, though, it's so disturbing is, is after she was kidnapped, the person kept her alive for like a week and abused her over and over and then um, duct tape her mouth shut and her eyes closed and tied her to a tree and she um, she died of exposure okay it's crazy degree and sodomy well it couldn't have been nine days because Earl Cox is my office has charged, charged Earl, Earl w. Cox w. with murder in the first degree kidnapping in the first degree and sodomy Earl Cox is currently uh, a patient in a federal medical facility located in North Carolina. Uh, he is there as a result of a civil commitment proceeding that came after a sentence he served in a child pornography ring that was prosecuted federally out of the state of Colorado. Um, the key in this case, obviously, is the DNA evidence. Um, and I, I cannot emphasize enough the dedication and brilliance of the St. Charles County Crime Lab in, in basically solving this crime. And that's not to diminish the work that anybody else who involved, who was involved in this investigation did. Uh, we had numerous crime labs involved. We had the Missouri State Highway Patrol. We had St. Louis County Crime Lab. We had the FBI um, over the years. Now, as you can imagine, we're sitting here in 19, or 2019. Uh, the advancements in DNA technology are staggering compared to what we had in its initial stages. In fact, the evidence uh, was never uh, DNA tested until approximately 2004. Uh, and I say that because the, the advancements in technology up to 2004 uh, really wouldn't have revealed any sort of significant DNA evidence. What made this particular case such a challenge for our crime lab professionals were several things. I want to try to list those. Uh, it, the, first of all, the age of, of the samples, the, the uh, evidence that was tested. 
Um, and many years had passed before the, the DNA processing began. Uh, there's a process in, in the DNA world known as degradation, which means uh, the longer uh, the time passes since the DNA may have transferred to an object that's tested, the more likelihood that that DNA is no longer detectable. Uh, in addition, as you can imagine, we had uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of individuals involved in investigating this case, handling evidence, uh, going to various departments, various criminal laboratories to be tested. Uh, there were many, many individuals involved and multiple labs involved. Every single time a test is performed, it makes it that much more difficult for any item to be retested again. In other words, you've used up whatever may have been there, so you can't go back and retest. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a, a development in uh, approximately 2017, which really was a game changer for us. Prior to that time, an item of clothing, for example, that was DNA tested. If it had any sort of dye in it, uh, a dye acted as an inhibitor, and it called for an inconsistent or inconclusive DNA result. The items tested, in this case in particular, the, the underpants that we reference, um, there was this piece right here. That actually is the piece that was tested that resulted in the DNA hit that I've just described. You can see its pink color. Uh, that's the dye from the, the trim of her underpants. Uh, the breakthrough in technology that came about in 2017 allowed these folks to test this object and not have the dye act as an inhibitor. So that was a huge uh, breakthrough for us. And on top of that, uh, these guys, it's a three-person lab. They have thousands and thousands of evidentiary items to test each and every day. Uh, they, they've got a, a caseload that's, um, you know, just, just like all of us in public service. We wish we had more manpower and more resources, but they're limited, and so they do the best that they can with what they have. Um, this was a cold case. That doesn't mean it was a dead case. It just means it wasn't on an active track the same way uh, that other cases may be. Uh, so you've put all those factors together, and that helps explain why we got where we are. Now, I will tell you this. The fact that it took this long for us to be able to... They said what it was. It's a... Um part of the undergarment, you know, or underwear, that they extracted DNA from. We used the current technology and do the DNA testing, which gave us the result that we have. That was a blessing in disguise. Had we tested this particular item any sooner than we did, there's a very good chance that nothing would have come about because the technology wasn't advanced enough. And that piece of evidence would have just been uh, put back in its place and we move on to the next piece and it never would have been retested. I bet you would have retested um, it. In talking to Brian Hampton, Brian Hampton the uh, St. Charles County Crime Lab Director, Brian said to me, and I thought it was great, and I wrote this down, uh, he said he talks to his team about the three T's in particular in this case. Technology, tenacity, and time. And that's the model that these guys use and that got us to where we needed to be. Uh, so this case uh, it's, it's about much, much more than just uh, the, the DNA analysis, uh, but in particular, the, the finding that was the linchpin for us was good science, good lab work, and just good luck. Um, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, you know, it's not like on TV or CSI where something goes to the crime lab and within a few minutes they find a DNA sample. Uh, it's much more tedious than that. Without uh, bodily fluids such as blood, or seminal fluid, uh, there's no way to know where DNA. Thanks, Meredith McKenzie. Uh, well, um, let's see. The thing is, this is, this is actually in June 2019, this arrest that was made, okay? Or at least not, a, a, you know, the DNA profile. And, and they made an arrest, but there was more news that just came out two days ago. It may exist on a particular item. And so that's why it's literally like looking for a needle in a haystack. And, and Brian and I joked about this uh, earlier this morning. Uh, they were looking for a needle in a haystack without a magnet, but they still found the needle. I just want to uh, wrap up uh, this portion before we uh, entertain questions and, and just, again, recognize so many people, uh, more than just the yeah, people. So the, the, the questions aren't part of this clip that I found. 
that we're following. Charges are officially filed in the kidnapping, killing, and sexual assault of Angie Hausman 25 years ago. Fox News' Maddie Murphy brought us exclusive details about the suspect's violent criminal past last night, and she's here now with new information about this horrific case. Maddie, it is heartbreaking. Thanks, Dottie O'Cast. It really is. I can now give out the name of the man who we told you about last night, who is now officially charged with one of the most heinous crimes our area has ever seen. 61-year-old Earl Cox is the person police say matched with the DNA found on Angie Hausman's body. Recent tests made this startling discovery. Cox's DNA is in a federal registry because he's in prison in Butner, North Carolina. He's been in and out of prison for sexually abusing children his entire life. He grew up in St. Louis and lived just a few streets away from where Hausman lived and got off her school bus that fateful day in 1993. St. Charles County Prosecutor Tim Lomar during a press conference today described the graphic details on so we, how we didn't see, hear this. Listen, listen. Angie's nude body was found partially covered with snow. Her head was wrapped in duct tape except for her nose. Her hands were handcuffed behind her back and her left arm was bound to a tree. There were deep lacerations to both her left and her right wrist and also to her right thigh. The duct tape around her wrist appeared to have been put there so as to slow the bleeding. Lomar says the technology that the shit you've wasn't ever heard in your available life, to test fabric I mean, my God. that contained dye prior to 2017. They tested a piece of Angie's underwear hey, thanks, that was found teacher in man, her body. Lomar also said there will likely be additional child I don't think I've ever heard of anything These quite as horrific as that for a, a child. I mean, that's just... Wow. I mean, kept alive for over a week, um, abused, tortured, whole body duct tape, basically. I mean, head completely duct tape other than a spot for her nose, her, you know, it's just, I mean, it just shows you that we're, our, you know, we're, we're, our world just full of absolute monsters, you know, they're, you know, hope, thank God most people aren't like that, but there's so many of them. It sucks out of St. Louis County for a case involving Cox from the late 80s in Overland. And he also says newbie, there could be my good friend Rebel Rose brought me. Cool tunnel. He looks well, like you. a sea. Yeah, well, thanks for joining the channel there and thanks Rebel Rose for suggesting it. But bottom line today, Shirley and Sandy, there was a great sense of relief in that room at the press conference. I was there for a lot of those longtime investigators who have never stopped looking for Angie's killer. So some relief and some closure, right? And one of the no. things I think a lot of people thought is why is the DNA testing just now coming out? But he explained mm -hmm. that in great detail that it's really advancements in that technology. It's come a long way. And because this fabric had that dye on it, mm -hmm. That made it very difficult to check as well. Yeah. Another thing that's really difficult, though, is that her mom is not here. So she passed away yeah, two passed years away. ago and never found never out knew. this news. Yeah. All right, Mandy Shirley, Murphy, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been looking into... Webster Cox was arrested for the abduction and murder of nine-year-old Angie Hausman just last summer. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kay Quinn. And I'm Art Holiday. We have team coverage from the St. Charles County Courthouse. The I-Team's PJ Rondawa is there with the latest. PJ? Art, well, it was a really emotional scene inside the courtroom as this we is finally today. heard oh, two days exactly ago. what Angie had to go through in her final days. Earl Webster Cox pled guilty today in exchange for life in jail. Now, the death penalty was on the table. It's no longer an option. He admitted his part in the murder. He basically oh, walked us so through how he abducted Angie moments after she got off the school bus that day in November of 1993. He took her to his mobile home in Wentzville where he kept her for several days. And he also went into detail about how he simply left her in a wooded area tied to a tree, nude See, and gagged. It was in this area. It was all very hard to hear family That's members where he, were openly his mobile home weeping was. in court as they Body there, maybe for the here. first time heard some of these details. I was able to speak with um, Angie's aunt yesterday who is really not happy with this plea deal and not happy by the idea that Earl Cox will spend the rest of his life in prison. He doesn't deserve to live. 
And I'm never going to change my mind about that. Well, you got and that he's right. going to go to hell. He didn't do it by himself. He won't do it too well in There's prison. There's no way he did it by himself. They tied her up in the t on the tree. One person can't do that if she's wiggling. I'm sure she's fighting. See, that? that's going to mess me up. <laughs> Yeah, um, so there's some people that maybe think that the other person that was in the hospital had something to do with it, too, right? But apparently they kind of dismissed that. I'm starting to get tears in my eyes. Well, I'm here with Five on Your Side's Christine Byers. Christine, you've covered this case for several years now. What were your impressions about what you heard? So what struck me about the court hearing today was, first of all, Mr. Cox really had nothing to say for himself, didn't give any statements. But the people that were here today um, to speak on behalf of Angie's parents were their siblings. Um, her father's sister and her mother's sister spoke on their behalf. Her mother died in 2016, and her father was too overcome with emotion to be here today. Yeah. Now to a breaking news update. So, a 25-year-old cold case may be solved as investigators charge a man with the murder of Angie Houston. The nine-year-old... I think we already played this one, similar to, well, it was very similar to the one that we watched. But prosecutors also believe there may be other people involved in the murder. One person who hasn't been ruled out as of today is Ron Bone, Angie's stepfather. Yeah, see what, see, that's so ridiculous, okay? They're still going after the stepdad after all these years? I mean, come on. All right, uh... I think that's about, let me see if there's anything else in this article here. I guess that's the guy right there, Earl Webster Cox. Yeah, just a freaking barbarian. A deer hunter found Angie's body nine days after she disappeared. She had been starved, bound, sexually assaulted, and her eyes and mouth were covered with duct tape. Authorities believe she died from exposure within about a day before she was found. I mean, think about how much suffering uh, this nine-year-old had to do. My God, it's just, uh, you know, it's one of those ones that actually just makes you sad, you know? It's like, she's in the woods there, trying to hang on, can't see, can't hear. The only thing she can do is breathe. Maybe she can hear, but can't, you know. And, Nobody's coming, and she just she just dies you know, over time, many hours. It's crazy. Psychos. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> if anybody deserves the death penalty, it's that guy, all right? Let's be honest. All right, I'm going to switch to a different story now, and what was cool, I didn't know this prior to this, but the next one is the Amber... Hagerman, 1996, and that's where the term Amber Alert came from. Okay, but these all these came while researching this last one. The names kept popping up in various articles. All right, so here we go. And she is nine also. Richard Hagerman was going through an ordeal with a stricken, uh, with, oh no, this is crazy. Listen to how crazy this is. With a sickening familiarity late Monday as he waited word of his abducted nine-year-old daughter, Amber, missing since Saturday afternoon. Police and FBI agents, this is in Texas here, were searching for the child but said no trace of her had been found since a witness saw an unidentified man snatch her from her bicycle as she was playing on the parking lot of an abandoned supermarket. I have all of the spots uh, marked on this one, too. For, for Hagerman and others in his family, it was the second time they have endured such a vigil. In the summer of 1991, so just five years prior, Hagerman... Then, two-day-old granddaughter, Felicia Hagerman, was abducted and held for 10 days before police recovered her unharmed. It's ironic, said Hagerman, 45. I don't know if this is... 
sort of bad luck follows me around. I don't know what I can do to stop it. It's frightening. Jimmy Kevill, 78, said he was working on a car in his driveway near an empty Winn-Dixie lot just east of downtown Arlington about 3 p.m. Saturday when he noticed Amber riding her bicycle up and down a loading ramp. Uh, next, said Kevill, a black pickup stopped by the ramp and a man jumped out. It was about 100 yards away and I couldn't see that well, but he wasn't a big man, said Kevill, but he was moving fast. I guess that's what caught my attention. He sprinted right up behind that little girl and jerked her off that bicycle and dragged her back to the truck. Then took off west towards downtown. All right. So here we go. Uh, I have. They were really good about with maps and describing everything. So the witness lived right here at this house right here, and from there was able to see uh, in the parking lot over here. You can you can see there's an angle there, and she was just riding her bike around back here. And amazingly, the Google Earth actually drove into the parking lot. And let's see if we can land it on the thing so it shows up. Okay, there we go. So she was abducted right here. And you can see the little ramp right there, the loading ramp. She's just goofing around, playing, playing, playing. Then the black pickup truck shows up, pulls up right next to her, and puts her in the car, and then gets right out onto this highway here and heads west. Just like this. Okay. kind of cool having Google Earth to actually see what shit looked like, don't you think? Because it makes you feel like you, you really can picture it. Okay, so I'm going to... A child was in the room with the mother when a woman approached, identified... I'm trying to read about that other one. As a photographer and said she was taking... So that other one was just somebody abducting somebody's baby. A woman doing it. You hear that often. Okay, then this is literally uh, just two days later. The body of a small child with long dark hair was discovered in a creek bed near Texas 360 and Northeast Green Oaks Boulevard in far north Arlington late last night. Authorities said the body matched the description of Amber Hagerman, 9, who has been missing since Saturday. Jerry Verst, 33, a resident of Forest Ridge Apartments, said he was standing on his second floor balcony looking out when he heard someone yell. Uh, he heard somebody yell, what's going on? And the person replied, there's a body in the creek. Worse said he then called 911. Officers said the body was naked. The body lay in a natural creek channel behind the apartment complex. Worse said he took a flashlight and went to the creek after he called 911. I saw black hair, he said. The body was real white. The body was found at 11.41 p.m. in a creek bed near the 2900 block of Forest Hollow Lane. Officials with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office were at the scene, but no other information was available early this morning. And here's that spot. This is the apartment complex right here, or duplexes, whatever the hell they are. Uh, the 2900 block is right here, and there's a little creek. So I could imagine, you know, if you look up here, there's a balcony off of those that you could probably yell down to somebody, well, what's going on, what's going on? And she was found in, the, in this creek right down here. And now look how crazy this is. Uh, Donna Whitson still makes daily visits to the flower and teddy bear covered shrine set up in East Arlington parking lot where her nine-year-old daughter Amber Hagerman was abducted. Uh, Whitson is now mourning another tragedy. And this is just a month, two months later, a month and a half. Whitson is now mourning another tragedy. Late Thursday, her fiance, Marion Allen, Lake Jr. was killed in a head-on collision on South Cooper Street. 
Oh my god, can you just imagine the hell hole that this whole time is? I don't have much strength left, Whitson said yesterday. I pray to God nothing else happens like this. It's hard to deal with. He was my best friend. It's pretty awful to lose two best friends in one year because Amber was also my best friend. Thanks, Miss Gis. Whitson, 28, said she had known Lake since she was 13. The two were sweethearts at Sam Houston High School and had stayed in touch when Amber was abducted January 13th from the parking lot of the, you know, so it's just another, just ridiculous. Then a year later, 1997, uh, you know, just more stories about learning to keep with, uh, cope with the loss. And then here's a timeline, so we can take a look at this, and another article. Thanks so much, Gray. Well, thank you. Miss Kiss. <coughs> a man working in his backyard hears screams and sees Amber Hagerman dragged from her bicycle and forced into a full-size uh, black pickup truck. That was on January 13th. Amber's body is found on the 17th. Uh, FBI child abduction and serial killer unit arrives on the 22nd. March 15th, FBI ends direct involvement with the Amber investigation and the Amber Hagerman task force um, is announced. April 1st, Arlington Police Department opens its Amber files to more than 100 investigators from across the state they return from the symposium of investigators with no new clues, but believing they are on the right track. April 18th, task force members travel to Austin to brief the Texas Homicide Assistance Team, a group of seven people from various agencies around the state, including homicide investigators and profilers. And then November 1996, so you know, 10, 11 months later, task force members begin looking at former Arlington resident Howard Stephen Alt, accused of kidnapping and killing two Florida sisters, investigators determined he was not in Arlington area at the time of Amber's disappearance. And then April 1997, task force members return to Austin, teach a course in major case management, and present the case to a class of seasoned homicide investigators and across the state and beyond. And then task force members travel to Friendswood, a Houston suburb, to compare notes with officers investigating the disappearance and death of Laura Smither, 12. Police said, I mean, look at all these other, see, that's what's crazy when you're doing what I do is in the articles they mention how, oh, it's similar to these other two. And then sometimes those aren't solved and some are solved, but it just gives you a, a crazy feeling of the sheer number of these types of, of pedophiles that are out there. You know, it's really scary shit. Thanks, Dadio Caspi Nurses, right? May 8th, task force members host a brainstorming session. Then June 23rd, Arlington police announced they will shut down the Amber Hagerman task force. Okay. <clears throat> and then we go to... You know, there's the mom. She's just totally devastated. It's been two years now. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of information in this, but it's not really related to the case. It's just, uh, you know, what was going on in the mother's life and things like that. So a freaking nightmare, though. Um, let me get to the next one. So then 1999, March 31st, hundreds pray for Opal. Let's look out. Now, here's where I, then I switched to another case here in a second. So look at this. Hundreds pray for Opal's safe return. Hands clasping candles, eyes brimming with tears. They came by the hundreds. Now look who's in this picture. Donna Whitson, the mother of Amber, is hugging and, you know, comforting Opal's mom. 
All right. I mean, it's literally uh, three years later. So let me pull this one up. So this is from a later article now, going back to Amber, but I'll be talking about Opal here in a minute. 1996 killing of Amber Hagerman 9 led to na National Amber Alert Program. I didn't realize that. Amber was taken as she rode her bicycle in a grocery store parking lot near East Abram Street in Browning Drive on January 13, 1996. A man working in his backyard called police after hearing the third grader screams and seeing a man driving a dark colored pickup take the girl from her bike then drive away with her. A man walking his dog found Amber's body four days later in North Arlington on the bank of a creek east of Texas 360 and north of Green Oaks Boulevard. Her throat had been slashed. She wore only a sock on her right foot. Within a day, almost 50 detectives were on the case and a task force was formed, but in 18 months, the number of investigators dwindled as leads started drying up. At one point, there was a $75,000 reward. As her mother, I'm not going to give up. I still have hope that he will be caught one day. Lopez estimated that the department will still receive two or three tips a month. If we get a new lead, now we will check to see if that lead has already been covered. A year after Amber's death, the Dallas-Fort Worth Association of Radio Managers teamed with area law enforcement agencies to implement the Amber Plan. See, it wasn't called that back then. An early warning broadcast system that notifies the public when a child is abducted. I think it's so cool when parents uh, make something turn into something great, you know, like that. It, it, what, what it is, what's weird about the Amber Alert, though, I understand why, but sometimes it's hard to get activated because you have to have specific information, like a vehicle, and that would have been perfect in her case, right? Be on the lookout for a black uh, pickup truck heading this direction, and maybe somebody would have spotted it. You can't just say somebody's missing and do an Amber Alert because there's nothing to go on. Yeah, and this was a map that I found, and it was it was cool because it actually. Let me show you how accurate the in the uh, newspaper it was. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it's pretty damn good for. You know, you look at this. You know, the buildings aren't quite right; like that's not square like they have it. But there's the laundromat. It's still a laundromat. Uh, they have right here is where she was abducted, right in between there. Then you've got the store right there then the neighbor right behind the fence and it's kind of interesting because I think you can right here you can almost see the fence that they're talking about yeah like right back here you can see the fence Okay, so now, as we just saw a minute ago, 1999, it was the case of Obel, Opal Joe Jennings. In 1999, that's the one where uh, Amber's mother was consoling the person. Okay, so here we go. Another, this girl's only six, okay? And this one has a, really some, you know, this one is, is solved. <coughs> um, the killer is a just absolute psycho, and it shows you the depravity of, of pedophiles, okay? The practicing ones, okay, everybody? Don't cut down the ones that aren't practicing, all right? Lest you be told you're a bigot. Less than 24 hours after a Dallas girl was released after apparently being abducted, Saginaw police combed uh, North Tarrant County last night for a six-year-old girl they believe was taken while playing near her home. Saginaw detective James Neal said police have not found any link between the two incidents. 
According to police, Opal Joe Jennings was picked up in the 200 block of North Hampshire Street. So she was actually living with her grandparents. And again, I was able to find the actual address. And here it is, 209, 209. It was this house right there. It's weird, it kind of looks like a church in a way. You know, that, that look, I don't know. Or, or, or any house from 1965 to 75, right? Yeah, so she lived right here. And it's crazy because I think it doesn't look any different now, the way things are described. Interestingly, there's a person there. Uh, <laughs> they usually blur those guys out. But According to police, Opal Jennings was picked up in the 200 block of North Hampshire Street about 5.30 p.m. yesterday by a white man driving a dark blue or black car with a brown top. Several neighborhood children reported seeing the car cruise the neighborhood minutes earlier. So the Amber case hasn't been solved yet, okay, but this one has been. Opal was playing with a cousin and a neighborhood friend when police believe she was snatched from a grassy lot less than 20 yards from home. Her grandfather, Robert Sanford, uh, just warned Opal to play closer to the house. Opal, a kindergarten kindergartner at Saginaw Elementary School, was wearing a white t-shirt with purple stripes, purple shorts, white socks, and Barbie tennis shoes. Her auburn hair was in two pigtails. She weighs 60 pounds and is about four feet tall. Audrey Sanford, Opal's grandmother, said she realized that Opal was missing when her two-year-old cousin came to the door crying. He said, Opal has gone bye-bye in a car, said Sanford, who with her husband is Opal's legal guardian. It's a little bit like um, you know, Mike and Becky Patty with a, a younger a, a grandchild, there, but they're the guardian. When Audrey Sanifer rushed out to look for Opal, another child told her that a car pulled up to her when, where the children had been playing and picked Opal up. The man pushed her into the passenger side of the car and drove off, the child said. Sanifer said she and Opal had talked about strangers less than 24 hours earlier when TV stations reported on what appeared to be an abduction of a Dallas girl, Fleisha Moore, 9, was found about six hours after she was taken from southeast Dallas by a man driving a pickup. The man dropped her off in Navarro County. Police activated the Amber Plan to notify the public about the Dallas incident. The publicity led Opal to ask her grandparents about the Amber Plan, which is an alert system that was initiated after Amber Hagerman of Arlington was abducted and killed in January 1996. I had just talked to Opal about the Amber Alert and not to talk to strangers, said Sanford, who suspected that her granddaughter likely froze when she was confronted by the man who picked her up. Opal's mother, Leola Sanford, lives in North Dakota, and her father, Randy Crawford, lives in Arkansas. She said neither had been reached as of late last night. Grandmother struggles to keep her hopes alive. As the grandmother of a missing Saginaw girl struggled to keep hope alive yesterday, local authorities offered no revelations into the six-year-old's abduction. News crews continued their vigil outside the modest home of Audrey and Robert Sanford. Their granddaughter, Opal Joe Jennings, was abducted only yards from the home Friday evening as she played with friends. Police said a white man with a ponytail driving a dark purple or black blue door sedan or two door sedan picked her up and punched her in the chest and threw her in the car I mean who the hell does that shit I mean this, this is probably one of the more disturbing episodes that I've ever done it's just uh, you know some idiots go hey how come you always just cover the ones with the little girls well because look at the hell that the most vulnerable people in our population go through. It's just disgusting. 
Anyways, Audrey Sanford, Opal's legal guardian, had spoken bravely in interview after interview, but inside, away from the camera, she began to bend under the strain. Everybody keeps asking me how I feel. Law enforcement officials in the North Torrent County city of about 12,000 said that despite numerous telephone tips, they still have no clear leads on Opal's whereabouts. We want to ask the community to help us, Detective James Neely of the Saginaw Police Department said. Yeah, so they're, they're just not really getting anywhere, okay? And then we move forward to uh, 2004. Okay, but here's the thing is they did make an arrest um, later in 1999, okay? But I'm just going to go jump forward here. Evidence suggests remains are opal. So this is literally five years later um, after they had made an arrest and things were moving forward. Somehow they were able they searched a certain area. I don't know how they got the information, but it says the discovery of a pair of pink Barbie tennis shoes, as we just heard a minute ago she was wearing, and part of a uh, child's skull this week in northwest Fort Worth suggests that Opal Joe Jennings has been found, the Tarrant County Medical Examiner said Friday. The size 13 tennis shoes are the same type that Opal 6 was wearing when she was abducted as she played outside her grandparents' Saginaw home in 1999. Perwani stressed, however, that, the, that until DNA testing is completed, he cannot be positive about the identification. Thanks, Linda Howell, as in Linda Moldenhow of the Cattle Mutilations. And that's why she puts the cow on there. Good night. Internet problem. Love you all growing heart, cow. Well, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, so this is a lot longer going on here so they actually have a map here and it was pretty close again so they do get on the maps in this newspaper article here okay opal was wearing scuffed barbie tennis shoes uh, a purple and white striped t-shirt and purple shorts when she was abducted march 26 1999 while playing with two other children near her grandmother's home in saginaw she was never seen again Authorities later arrested Richard Lee Franks of Fort Worth, who told investigators that he gave Opal a ride to a convenience store and dropped her off safely the day she disappeared. Well, he actually uh, wrote a, a documented statement, and I'm going to read it to you guys here in a minute. It's just, he's a, he's a one sicko. Not because he told the truth, it's because of what he said happened. Okay. On Friday, Homicide Sergeant J.D. Thornton said searchers found one of the pink Barbie shoes Wednesday and the other Friday a good distance apart. One was near the area where the original skull was found. The other is in the area not in proximity. Thornton declined to say whether other uh, clothing had been found. Lieutenant Jess Hernandez, a police spokesman, estimated that evidence had been found scattered over, over several, several hundred yards. A forensic anthropologist has estimated the skull is that of a child aged 5 to 7. David Montague, senior staff attorney with the Tarrant County District Attorney's Office, said that if the skeletal remains are identified as opals, more charges against Frank are possible. I think you'd have to have some evidence to tie him to the location or the body, Montague says. Anything like that would certainly open a possibility up looking at additional charges. If no such evidence is found, Montague said he does not believe that Frank's original conviction will be effective. At a news conference Friday, Perwani said his, I think there was a mistrial originally on his first trial. Bones are what will help us identify her. So I do have these locations too. So this is where she lived and then she was found way down here yeah see again just sort of this crazy little rural area 
So it's not really that far from her house, though. It was only, I believe, something like four miles. Now it's about ten. But so it's uh, really close, and apparently it was right here, and I guess sort of near a culvert or something. I don't. It's hard to see, but um, because there's no, st I don't know if there's street view here. Well, I guess there is. Let me let me take a look right here. I think the person just drove into this field here at the time and put her back there. Now this is where she was found. Or saying person was too kind. Yeah, and I didn't really see a culvert or anything down here. Let me let me just see. Yeah, but they gave uh, specific uh, location information. That's why I was able to put the pin where I did it. So it's right in this area here. It was like 100 yards from West Oaks Road, just off of that one, or off of that road. Yes, coffee and a donut. Thanks, Kit Kat. Okay, I'm going to move on to another article here. DNA tests prove bones are opal. So that's the factual information that came out. They did DNA and they were able to determine that they were opal's bones. Uh, opal was killed by a crushing blow to the right side of her forehead from a blunt instrument, he said. Perwani ruled Opal's death a homicide. DNA tests took much less time than Perwani predicted. Ten days ago, because a coffee and a donut smile, a tooth was actually found. Opal's great aunt Teresa Sunderford said the family plans to organize a public memorial. Now this thing here was a really good timeline at the bottom down here, so I'm going to go over this one. A similar map and uh, let's go through this one so in September 1998 Opal Joe Jennings moves to Saginaw to live with her grandparents Robert and Audrey Sanderford and that's what I was able to look up one of their names and found it Opal and her half-sister uh, let's see. Audrey Sanford, after her mother decided she could not support Opal and her half sister on a waitress salary. That nah, sounds like he just kind of gave up. I don't. I don't believe that shit at all. Hey, thanks, Kim F. Sharp Harp. Yeah, well, that's basically what it is. Like I tell you guys, uh, whatever you guys donate, I take a large percentage of it. It's usually, I take 25% uh, of the gross income on YouTube and donate it to charity. And then I pay taxes on all of it. So it ends up being something like, you know, 60-40 split. I think it's a pretty generous For the monthly uh, donations donation. to help the kids. Too many monsters out there. You know, and the thing is, what's cool is over the whole month, we build up so much that at the end of the month, I like last month, we donated two thousand four hundred dollars. OK. And so far this year, ten thousand six hundred. And if you can find another channel that donates that equivalent, let me know. OK. March 26, 1999, Opal Six is abducted outside her grandparents home at 530 p.m. Playmates tell police a stranger punches her in the stomach and drives away with her. The search soon moves to a rocky quarry and muddy lake near Old Decatur Road and Loop 820 and last four days, but they didn't find anything. Arlington police, who investigated the 1996 kidnapping and slaying of Amber Hagerman, 9, consult with Saginaw police. The FBI sets up a command post in Saginaw. And then April 1st, 1999, Opal's mother, Leola Sanford, arrives from North Dakota. 
April 3rd, 1999, volunteers search on foot and horseback across Saginaw. April 6, 1999, Good Morning America and Inside Edition broadcast segments on the case. April 23rd, Leola Sanders returns to North Dakota. Uh, May 19th, 1999, experts from the FBI National Center for Analysis of Violent Crime Profile, Opal's Abductor. July 1999, investigators from 16 agencies combined resources to follow leads. August 17th, 1999, Richard Lee Franks of Fort Worth is arrested and tells authorities that Opal initiated sexual contact with him. Yeah, six-year-old. Okay, great. You're an idiot. And that he let her go alive. <laughs> Does he? <coughs> did he really think somebody was going to believe that shit? Honestly? Uh, November 4th, 1999, Judy Franks, Frank's wife, is arrested and accused of lying to a grand jury. So this is the wife of the, the pedophile. To give her husband an alibi for the day of the kidnapping. November 9th, 1999, Richard Lee Franks is indicted on an aggravated kidnapping charge. April 12th, 2000, Judy Franks pleads guilty to aggravated perjury and gets a five-year deferred sentence. June 26, 2000, Richard Lee Frank's trial begins. On June 30th, a mistrial is declared after jurors split 75 in favor of conviction. Well, who were the idiots on there? September 2000, at his second trial, Frank's is found guilty of aggravated kidnapping. The jury also finds that he intended to sexually violate or abuse Opal. Well, of course he did. <laughs> She's six years old, for God's sake. Whose brain thought, well, it's, it's reasonable to believe that she... Thanks, Darrell Greggs. Franks is sentenced to life in prison on October 2nd, 2000. July 18th, 2002, three justices of the Second Court of Appeals affirm Franks' conviction. December 30th, 2003, two people riding horses in the 9900 block of Western Oaks Road. Hello, freaks. Well, Long time no see. Let's see. 9900 Western Oaks Road. Yeah, so it's right, right in this area. Okay. And, and it could probably be, let's see where 9800 is. Yep. Let me see. Is it backwards? Where's 98? Oh, I guess it's to give you the same one. So maybe 10,000? Yeah, there you go. So it goes here to there. So in that block is where the horse is ready. And I think that's it right there. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are... The two people riding horses in the 9900 block of Western Oaks Road in northwest Fort Worth find part of a skull less than 10 miles from where Opal was abducted. December 31st, police begin searching a heavily wooded area just off Western Oaks Road and find other bone fragments. And three days later, the Tarrant County Medical Examiner Office says that the partial skull is consistent with that of a child, age 5 to 7. Then on January 12th, Tarrant County Medical Examiner uh, Nizam Perwani confirms that the remains are those of Opal and that she died from a crushing blow to the head. Freaking monsters, man. All right, and you're the wind beneath my wings. Man, I'm trying to lift my arm. It's just, this sucks. And this is from 2016. There, there she is right there. And look how cute she was. Just a little, you know. I mean, it's just. Uh, You're the whatever. air in my lungs, Grey Hughes. Yeah, probably wearing some of that same kind of flowery stuff. And there's the guy right there. But he didn't look like that before. See, one thing about him was that he was 
he had like this long ponytail and all this crap going on and he shaved it off right after the description showed up in the paper and his parole officer from something else is the one that came forward and said hey yeah no he has a car that looks like that and he had this and he shaved you know so it all led to the, his arrest So the discovery of a pair of pink Barbie tennis shoes and part of a child's school this week in northwest Fort Worth suggests that Opal Joe Jennings has been found. The Tarrant County Medical Examiner said Friday the size 13 tennis shoes are the same. So this is original date. This is a 2016 article, but it's going back in time. Um, I can't speculate whether or not this is Opal Jennings. Um, Yeah, booking photo of Richard Lee Franks from 1994 arrest in Wise County. So that's before, right? So it was five years before, so that's why he was on probation. And he was arrested as a suspect in the abduction of Opal Joe Jennings. And uh, Opal was wearing scuffed pink Barbie tennis shoes, a purple and white striped T-shirt, and purple shorts when she was abducted March 26, 1999, while playing with two other children. And then here we go with uh, so this is a, a website it's in the description cowtowncrime.com thanks audio Caspian horses rock so here's the guy right there I'm gonna go down to oh here this is what I'll I'll, I'll read this part because it's interesting On April 1st, Frank's probation officer noticed a change in him. This was Frank's first meeting after the Opal Joe Jennings kidnapping. Frank showed up for the meeting with his ponytail cut off. His hair was now short. He was clean shaven. The probation officer remembered Frank's previously wearing a red ball cap all the time. Because uh, apparently the, the witnesses said that he had a, a red ball cap on. He never saw him with it again. He also knew that Franks drove a car similar to what was being described in the media. He called in a tip to the police line. Weeks later, police got that tip. When they arrived to meet with Franks, they noticed he drove a black Cougar, a glossy car that might be considered uh, purple, purple, dye, purple dye black by a young child. Uh, purple, I don't know what that's saying, purpley or black by a young child. They also learned that Frank's brother had lived on the same street as Opal's grandparents. Frank was familiar with the neighborhood. He had visited his brother not a hundred feet from the Opal. I mean, isn't that crazy? So this guy's brother lived right on the same street where the grandparents lived. It's possible Frank's had been, had seen Opal and other children playing at the location. A promising lead to be sure, but police didn't have enough yet for an arrest warrant. However, Franks had a traffic warrant. Police picked him for that on August 17th, picked him up on that on August 17th, 1999, around 8.30 p.m. Instead of being taken to the police station, he was taken to the special crime section of the Tarrant County Criminal Invest, uh, District Attorney's Office, where he met was met by Danny McCormick and investigators who told him he would like that they would like to talk to him about his disappearance of Opal Joe Jennings. Franks agreed with everything they asked. He asked to, uh, I mean, he agreed to his car being searched. I, it's hard for me to read because I have to lean way back and I can't sit next to the computer like I do. He also waived his Fifth Amendment right and agreed to talk with investigators. McCormick waited for the polygraph examiner, Eric Holden, to arrive. This wasn't wasted time, although he didn't, question Franks during the time McCormick was building a rapport with him. Holden arrived around 10.30 p.m. and it was showtime. Before administering a polygraph, the examiner must first determine if the subject is voluntarily agreeing and if they are capable of taking the polygraph. They cannot be medicated or intoxicated. They can't be suffering under severe mental defect. The polygraph examiner needs to set a baseline 
by asking questions with known answers. Anyways, by 2 p.m., Holden was ready to start the test. Half hour later, it was conducted. The test indicated deception by Franks. Anyways, listen to this part down there. I'm going to include the entire confession. Read it for yourself. Well, what's this one? If you click on that. Okay, so it's in this document here. So listen to what he says. You want to you hear some disturbing shit? This is what I think we're about to read here is what the pedophile wishes was going on. Like that's his sort of, his fantasy. Okay, listen to this shit. It's just disgusting. On March 26, 1999, I went to Saginaw, Texas to see my brother. That's exactly what he did on that street. When I saw Opal, Jennings, and two other kids playing in a field beside a house, this was about 4 p.m. in the afternoon or a little later. I was driving a Ford Cougar and was by myself. I went to, I went by Danny's house, saw the girls and a boy outside playing in the field. I stopped to talk to them and Opal said, where are you going? <laughs> you know, like as if she's just going to be. I was in the car and Opal was talking to me through the fence. She asked where I was going and I told her that I was going to see if my brother was home so I could go visit with him. I told, I told Opal, if he's not here, I'm going home. She said, they might, uh, they might be at work, and then asked her how she was doing, and she said she was doing good in school. She said that she was getting good grades. She came up to the car on the driver's side. The driver's door was open. She came up to the door, gave me a hug, and took my hand. I asked her if she was passing, and she said, I hope so. I, I don't know what that means, but uh, like getting in the car with them. I don't know. I then told her that if she was doing good in school, then she would. Oh, like, what does he mean by passing? I don't know. I hope you pass. Oh, passing the school. Okay. I hope you pass. The other kids wanted her to hurry up to hurry up so she could play with them. I said, you need to get back and finish playing what you are playing. They, are, <laughs> they were playing some kind of ball, he said. She reached into the car. I thought she was going to try and grab me. I didn't know what she was going to try to do, so I pushed her back and said, what are you trying to do? I'm not the one to be doing it with you, uh, to be doing it with. Like, she's six years old. He's actually thinking right now that she's coming on to him. I didn't want to do something that would get me in trouble. She was just a kid. I don't see myself doing nothing like that. I was afraid she was going to, to uh, make a pass at me or get me to take her somewhere. She was wanting me to take her to the store. She, wanted, she went around the front of the car to get into the passenger side. I was afraid she wanted me to take her to have sex with her or something. I took her to the store. She got in the passenger side... The other two kids were outside playing. I told her I was going to bring her back so she could finish playing with the other two kids. I took her to the convenience store a block from the house. I sat in the car and she got something to drink. She, she bought a Coke. Then she came back to the car, she said. Thank you for bringing me up here, but I said I don't want to do it again. Opal tried to move over toward me. I didn't know what she tried to do. She tried to grab me between the legs. She grabbed my dick, he says. She wanted to, you know, F me. I told her no. She said, F me. She tried to take her pants off. I told her no. She asked me why I said, why, and I said, because I don't do that. She asked me why, and I said, because you're too young, and I could get in trouble for it. I mean, isn't this the sickest shit you've ever heard in your life? See, that's, this is what this guy is wishing, okay? That's why he's coming up with this stuff. He actually said this in his, con, you know, his quote, confession. She unzipped my pants, took my, <laughs> and had it in her hand. She went down like she was going to go down on it. I pushed her back. I put my Johnson back in my pants. She was sitting beside me when she went to bend over. 
I pushed her back. I said, I'm not going to have sex with somebody younger than I am. I told her that she needed to get out of the car. This happened on the way back to the store. I took her to the house and left her off at the same place where I talked to her at. I don't know if she went in the house or not. I just wanted to get away from her. You know, what a sick freak. I mean, monster, right? Like, oh, God. Just think about that. He's, he's, not only is he blaming her, the kid's six years old for God's sake. And all the witnesses said that he punched her and threw her into the passenger side. Yeah, it's just a... Like I told you guys, it's probably one of the sickest uh, nights. I don't know if he's ever been executed yet, but I think he did get the death penalty. But anyways, I don't really have much more for tonight. I was just going to struggle to get through that one. <laughs> Those three, it was just uh, <whistles> crazy. Yeah, that's some of the sickest shit I've ever heard. I mean, he's telling a story as if the, he, this little six-year-old came on to him. But why would he even put that in his story? Right? Like, it's just... His original story could have just been, yeah, I mean, I was there. I, you know, because they hadn't found her yet, right? But he put that in there because he was fantasizing about it. I did have this one article that popped up during it. I think it was this one. So these are where I got these two. This one article had the one on Amber, this one, on the one we were just talking about, on Opal, and then, but then it just keeps going. It's like this whole publication that was just all about these, um, I don't know if some of them are solved or unsolved. And this is from 2016. Oh, look at that. There's Trump. <laughs> there it is. The unsolved murder of Benny Faye Lennox. Maybe we could take a look at that one. See what that one's about. The vicious murder of a 16-year-old black girl in 1955 enraged and captivated the African-American community started rumors about a number of possible suspects and exposed the less than stellar, indeed less than average, performances of the Fort Worth Police Department and the Tarrant County District Attorney's Office. It was in the day of Jim Crow, a time when the death of Benny Faye Lennox exposed the opposite of what many young people today proclaim Black Lives Matter. Now this is four years ago. I guess that was back then too. I was a young child when news came on July 27th that the girl's body had been discovered in a sloping wooded area called Baptist Hill or more commonly, The Hill. In 2004, still haunted by... Well, hold on a second. Uh, between... Uh, let's see. Yeah, the problem is you got to start from the beginning on some of these. Um, it might not be even be in the paper, though. Maybe I'll... I'm going to put this one on to the side here and see if I can find some more about it instead of just going over it randomly. I like to get as much information as I can. But anyways, I want to see if I can go back and find stuff in the paper. I don't think 
Kevin that has anything to do with it. I think he's just sitting, sitting there thinking. He's thinking about what he wishes would have happened. You know, because he, he, he's attracted to prepubescent uh, children. He's a freaking pedophile. You know, the, the group that will eventually be deemed a protected class at some point, as I've explained to you, and it's going to happen. The non-practicing ones, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> What's the note for? No, I'm leaving. I gotta go. I gotta. I'm gonna go to bed early tonight. It's a little bit slow, anyways. On the yeah, it's pretty. I don't think he's trying to insinuate anybody. I think yeah. I mean, of course, that's what he's trying to say, but. <laughs> The fact that he, what's weird about him is he implies himself almost immediately after putting her in his own car and then saying she came on to him. Because then later he could sort of have an out. He could say, okay, I, I didn't I didn't really bring her home, but what happened was is this is what happened, and then I panicked, and then I, you know. Because I don't know what in the hell he was doing. Bringing that up. Well, it's going to become normalized. Go go watch some of the TED Talks and things like that. It's really disturbing. And they get cheers at the end and clapping. and Because people realize that there's no out for them, so they'll just accept it. You'll be labeled a bigot if you... Here's what's going to happen to you guys. You're going to be labeled a bigot if you don't allow your school teacher to be a pedophile if they are a known non-practicing pedophile you're going to be looked at as a bigot okay because they went through the hard work of not uh, acting out on their urges and you are going to be a bigot because you didn't want your kid to be taught by them and you want to see that happen no well, some are cool but some aren't right but you'll end up being like shunned and, and get in trouble and stuff. Yeah, that was some tough shit right there, wasn't it? Kit Kat? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Stacy Galloway made the whole night there. Those cases were extremely rough. Thank you for covering them, though. Well, thanks, Stacy. That was very kind. A double cat eye whammy. Just keep your eye out for what I just told you, though, and see if it happens in the next 10 years. And then go, God, great talking about that. Oh, hell, I'll still be doing a show, I think. <laughs> the Double Cat Eye. That was very kind. Stacy Galloway. Thank you so much, Gray, for everything you do. You're truly the best true crime investigator on YouTube. I love you and the Freak family so much. Purple heart, revolving hearts, purple heart, revolving hearts, purple heart. <laughs> yeah, I love you too. She's she's the, probably one of the nicest people in the world, anything. Allison R. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Bet you watch, teacher man. It's going to happen. You probably started teaching at a different time when it was a little bit more conservative in there. Now it's absolutely not like that at all. Any, anything goes. Yeah. Hmm. What else was there today? Oh yeah, here's the uh, Shannon, you know, Leela Cavett case. 
There's new video today of the suspect facing charges following the disappearance of a missing mom. He was transported from jail earlier today and he is charged with kidnapping after the mother vanished. Her toddler little son That's later right. found wandering all alone. It's today that man went before camp. a judge and local 10 news supporter Syra Onwar is live outside the Broward County Jail with what happened in federal court. Syra. So that suspect, Shannon Ryan, is actually in the federal courthouse right now waiting for his name to be called to appear before that magistrate judge. We're listening in on that meeting, too, and waiting to see what happens. He spent the night here in Broward Jail. In the meantime, the FBI is now offering... Well, I think you do the same thing, Stacey, for everybody else. You make everybody always feel so good and welcome and cared about. $10,000 to anyone that can help them solve this case of Layla Cabot. Better than I do it, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Shannon Ryan, transported by federal agents from the Broward County Jail this morning, he was taken to the federal courthouse for his first appearance before a judge for his alleged involvement in the disappearance of 21-year-old Layla Cavett. The FBI seen going through the dumpster area behind a racetrack gas station in Hollywood, taking photos. Two dumpsters were loaded onto two flatbeds covered with tarps. No official confirmation yet if that search was related to Cavett's disappearance, but police documents confirm Shannon Ryan, the man who claimed to be the last person to see Layla, was arrested on a kidnapping charge. A criminal complaint states he was on his phone searching the Hollywood commercial garbage pickup dates. Investigators say a gas station employee told detectives they recalled seeing Ryan using the racetrack dumpster and noticed children's toys and women's clothes inside that dumpster. Meanwhile, the yeah. FBI releasing new surveillance from the Hollywood racetrack, the last known images of Layla before she went missing on July 25th. According to the FBI, this is her white Chevy pickup truck that afternoon. She's seen later getting out of a Lexus, and the last image is of her inside the gas station store around 1015. And Layla. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Tonight, officers forced to fire. Yeah, so what do you want to do now? How about we'll do a... Uh... A 30 minute, <laughs> or I don't know, maybe go to 9.30. We'll do the newspaper.com. I know that's everybody's favorite. But let's try, to, let's, let's try to do something on the same thing here. Okay. I can do 45 more minutes. <laughs> uh so what do you want? What do you want to type in? Maybe how about this? You you got to send in a, a two dollar. I'm just kidding. You don't have to do anything. Just type in what you want to uh, look at. Yeah, I might be able to do another forty minutes or so. I'm just gonna sit back. Yeah. I, He's a pretty strange guy, that Shannon guy. Now, I'm not doing one that you've already, people have typed it in. Ah, oh, jeez. Maimed in Maine. Yeah, you want to look up some dog uh, attacks? How about... Let's just type in the, the standard dismembered body and then we'll pick uh, 1970 to 1981 and then pick, uh, let's see, Florida. Now oh, there you go. More suitcases. Dismembered body found in suitcases. A search was underway today for a Glenn Miller. The person believed to have shipped the... Oh, we already did this one, I think, didn't we? <laughs> I think I remember Glenn Miller. Let me see if there's another one here. This is 1974. Thanks, Dario Caspian Horses Rock. Let's see. A 28-year-old Tampa man was charged with first-degree murder today in what Sheriff 
Malcolm Beard described as the result of a love triangle and after the dismembered body of another man was found floating in Cypress Creek. Uh, wow. Uh, Beard said that Thomas Allen Hallowell, 28, of 1405 Villa Lane, Northside Village Apartments, was being held in county jail without bond on the murder charge. The dismembered body of Arnold Tresh, 30, 8824 of Inglewood Boulevard, Tampa, was discovered floating in the creek yesterday around 2.30 p.m. by Jim Lucas, a University of South Florida student. He spotted an object floating in the creek and after wading out, discovered that it was the upper portion of a human body. Sick times, huh? How about... We haven't tried, I mean, this is going to be crazy, but I'm just going to do a child's dismembered body. Let's see if it comes up, because that's sort of on the same theme. I just want to see what this says here. Oh, that's the same one. How about get rid of Florida? What is this guy? Jimmy Bird reading well with your card is there. In chilling detail, she describes how they dismembered the body and put it in a garbage bag and forced Dennis, Denise to hold it. She tells how she later beat her four-year-old son, Edward Jr., when he asked what happened to his sister. From the gruesome starting point, reporter Carol Jenkins and John Hambrick delve into the woman's background to get the roots of this horrible story. What would make a woman stand by while her child's body was dismembered? Huh. It's like it's a, some kind of a documentary or something. Thanks, Dottio Caspi Nurses Rock. Yeah, we defeat washing up on the shore happens in Canada. It turns out when a body if somebody drowns and they decompose in the water, the shoes will eventually be separated, you know, the feet from the body and then you'll find shoes you know with with uh, bone in it <laughs> heads hanging from a tree Gee, let's I'll try that one probably won't be in the United States but no how about head pain? Yeah, probably some other, like a different country. What else we got? Unicorn violently dehorned in Wonderland? <laughs> so, so they wouldn't, uh, an article though, David, wouldn't write it like that, right? They would probably say headless body found in lake or something like that. And there it is. Thanks, Allison R. Uh, police are trying to identify the headless 
handless body of a young woman found submerged and badly decomposed in Greenwood Lake. This is in New Jersey. State police disclosed yesterday that the body apparently mutilated to conceal the victim's identity was snagged by a fisherman off Sterling Forest Beach. Not until after the autopsy Saturday was the sex of the body known. She was described as about 5 feet 2, weighing about 110 pounds, and between 18 and 29 years of age. Okay, so now we know where this is. Let's see if we can find more out about it. So 1976, April 19th in, and this is in uh, New Jersey. All right, so April 1976, New Jersey. Okay, so there's only that one. So then what happened after that? How about May 19? 76. Okay. And this might be more info on that one. State woman's accused slayer to fate. Let's see. Plasson, a former resident of Point Marion, Pennsylvania, just north of here, is accused of the decapitation murder of Karen Farrell of... It's kind of cut off. So that was January. No, I think that's the same one. The man whose dismembered body was found in Munchie Dump Saturday died from a stab wound in his lower right chest. So then somebody cut him up. Yeah, sometimes they just never get solved. You know, these... Let me go back one... So what else they have in this? Decomposed in Greenwood Lake. Okay, so let's put in Probably just never solve. Too early for DNA or any of that stuff. Thanks, Liz Parsons. All right. Billy Smoliski missing 16 years today. A lot of missing people out there. Okay, I'll try that one, Christina. Yeah, it didn't come up with anything. Pickled people feet? Come on, try to think of something that leads to a crime, okay? You guys always struggle with the same thing. Think if you were looking up something on newspapers.com about certain types of cases and come up with that. Every week, oh God, the word arson. How many hits do you think that's gonna give? Honestly, I mean, it'd probably be uh, 50,000 of them and it'll all be the same. We already did the feet wash up on shore. I just explained to you what that means.
Yeah. Why, be more specific, though. You know, like put a gender in there, do everything. I mean, you know, bodies buried in cement, yada, yada, yada. Uh, bodies bu buried alive. There's a billion of those. It's just. I think it would be more like uh, yeah see you gotta think about how a newspaper would word it see police say a rich Los Angeles doctor confesses he buried body under sister okay this is 1925 Yeah, but what, see, look at man puts wife in washing machine. So what? You know, like <laughs> I'm just saying, it's not gonna. All right, here I'll show you. I'll I'll, I'll even put it in there. No, no responses. Yeah, these are just ads for washing machines. Yeah, I'll try what Molly Gator said. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. So articles on washing and uh, yeah, that's not really a crime though, is it? L dot M. Yeah, let's do. Uh, oh, forget it. If we don't want to do um, that, we'll just type in um, unidentified flying object and then go nineteen. 47 to 1960. And there we go. Look at that. Boom. This is from 1958. During a recent TV program on unidentified flying object, a disclosure I started to make was suddenly cut off the air. In minutes, CBS switchboards all over the country were jammed with demands for the answer. Why had I been cut off? What had I tried to reveal? <laughs> See, the same shit was going on even back then, right? Yeah. No, there it is. Look, look at that. It's a really a flying saucer. Oh, you mean it really is? Like someone took a saucer and threw it. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Hey, Jessica, don't you think that's a little too long of a description? Unless you actually took the quote from newspaper.com and said, hey, find this one. Man, you guys come up with some, some wild stuff. Body found tangled in electric wires. Okay. You know, this is always more fun for you guys. I <laughs> I mean, I like looking stuff up, but some of the stuff you kind of get upset that I don't look up or is just like, eh.
Kite flying fine, because your kite may be tangled in electric wires. Yay! I, was, I love these kind right here. Look at this. Dead body found in a Santa Fe boxcar. Well, thank you for letting me know that the body was dead. Okay, because if you had said the body was found in a Santa Fe boxcar, I would have said, well, is that is it dead or not? I think anytime you just refer to something as a body, it's dead. Okay. Cannibal house pack with bodies. You think that's litter? I'm not touching that one. Not touching it. Yeah. <laughs> Dadio Caspian horses rock. Well, I've tried a bunch of your stuff, but. Yeah, but do you think the article is going to say axe murder on farm? Just like that in the sentence? Let's see. Oh, God. Maybe it does. From 1936. <laughs> Look at that. Father Slayer to fight charge. To Lair Youth pleads not guilty to axe murder on farm. Oh, my God. You had to go back to 1936 to find somebody that writes so poorly. Uh, oh, look at that. It's in Vesalia. Or the Golden State Killer. We've got some crap right there. Vesalia, November 14th. Manuel M. Souza, 17, told to Lair Farm Boy, pleaded not guilty to a charge of first-degree murder this morning when arraigned before a superior judge. Young Souza asserts he killed his brother, well-known dairyman, because he threatened his mother and members of the family. The youth then kicked over an oil stove, setting fire to their home to conceal his crime, which police say was committed in rage because Sousa Sr. supplied information which would have been resulted in the boy's arrest for theft. I'll, I'll try Michelle Nicholas one. Now there's one in 2003. Workers at a motel found a dead man under a mattress Sunday while cleaning a room where a guest had spent three nights complaining repeatedly about a foul odor. The guest first complained about the smell when he checked in Thursday at the <clears throat> Capri Motel just east of town in downtown Kansas City, but management told the man nothing could be done about the odor. The man checked out Sunday because he said he could no longer tolerate the smell. Police were called around 11 a.m. Sunday after cleaning staff lifted the mattress where the guests had been sleeping oh, and found a man's body the remains were not immediately identified. Wood panels around the underside of the bed hid the body from view. Oh, man. So it was like decomposing, and he was made. He should sue the hell out of that hotel. Jesus. Police were looking for someone to talk to about the body, but no arrests had been made. Oh, it was just an accident. He. No, this is a whole different time. This is another one. A Jefferson motel maid discovered a woman's body hidden in a hollowed-out box spring of a bed, the city's first homicide this year. Jefferson police arrested 38-year-old Larry Dale Boosen, 
whom they described as a drifter and charged him with the obstruction of justice in the case. Police said the investigation is continuing and that additional charges could be filed. Police identified the victim as Darlene Natto, 38, of Lexington, Kentucky. They said Natto had been in Jefferson since December 23rd. An autopsy yesterday found that Natto had been strangled and that she died from asphyxiation. Her body was found Monday afternoon when a housekeeper making her rounds at the Scottish Inn at 1560 East 10th Street noticed a bed that was in disarray, according to Jefferson, uh, Jeffersonville Chief. The body was found in a box spring. I guess that's a thing. That's crazy. That's a good one there, Michelle Nicholas. You actually found sort of a weird niche. <laughs> like, what are the odds of that? So that was July. That's another July. <clears throat> so those are all the same ones. So there, was just, there was two stories on that though, which is crazy. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I don't think I'm gonna make it to the 9.30. I gotta go lay down here. I hate the feeling that I have where I, it's hard to lift the arm up and just stings. So, anyways, I appreciate all of you guys. And when I say guys, I just mean people. It doesn't mean guy, like a guy guy, you know. So thank you to Cairo, Teacher Man, 1955, became a member. Zozo, Crystal Ann, Meredith McKenzie, Dottie O'Cast, Minorsa's Rock, and then Teacher Man with a donation. Miss Skiss, Dottie O'Cast, Minorsa's Rock, Kika Keys, Linda Howell, Kit Kat, Kim F. Harp, or uh, Kim F. Sharp Harp, <laughs> Darrell Gregg, Zozo, Dottie O'Cast, Minorsa's Rock, Kit Kat, Stacy Galloway, Allison R., Dottie O'Caspi Nurses Rock, uh, two times in a row, Allison R., Liz Parsons, and Dottie O'Caspi Nurses Rock, and then Stacy Galloway's was the, the double cat eye donation. Thank you. Yeah. So, everybody, uh, make sure that you're you're still out there, you're doing your social distancing, washing your hands, and wearing your mask out there all the time, all right? So we'll probably see you guys tomorrow, hoping for a better day. We'll see how it goes, but uh, thanks Kevin Brown and Chrissy Paradis. Now, they're, they're really sad stories, uh, the, the three that I covered earlier, they suck. <laughs> So that's it, everybody. Thank you very much for showing up tonight. And uh, we'll probably be back on tomorrow. So until next time, be... Well, let me wait for these. Sorry, I'm so <laughs> late. We'll catch playback. Feel better, Gray. Freak love. Well, bang. Ding, 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 ding. No, oh, that's while I get her. Thanks, man. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. And until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a... Crime Dissector! Uh, I'm 
a certified human lie detector Gonna get ya, on a stretcher If you try and play me like an old projector Crime sector, here's my nectar Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture Crime collector, freak connector And I'm always gonna be a pup protector Fool deflector, interceptor And I'm meaner than a specter with a vector On his pector, with all respect ya Just remember I've a temple fucking check ya I have no agenda, I'm the pretender And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender And in the end, I'm gonna send ya On a mission to reveal the true offender Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work Alright everybody, talk to you Alright, hey, well, really sad, interesting show there But hey, good night, young boy Good night, Mary Lou Yeah, that's what I said, good night Wow, that's a miracle, everybody. I think they just felt sorry for me and wanted me to. <laughs> All right, everybody. Be safe out there.